Are you well? Okay. Yeah, great. I'm good, thanks. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Um, so obviously, you know, we're, we're getting um, a deluxe edition of uh, Dead Wing, which is released on March the 3rd. I will put a purchasing link uh, just below yeah. this video. Um, I, so my first question really... yesterday. Oh, oh wow. It, it comes yeah. out on March the 3rd, though, doesn't it? Here, officially. Yes. Um, they sent through my copy yesterday. Lovely. Yeah, really nice. Um, well, I suppose what I've got to ask you is is why why have they issued this? I mean, did they feel it needed a, a sonic tweak or something like that? Um... The company Snapper, uh, okay. kind of, they have basically uh, our whole back catalogue. Right. Um, some of it licensed, some of it they own. Right. And um, they found that there's a big interest for physical physical media, especially with Porcupine Tree. Yeah, especially with the older and, generation. Yeah, as well. exactly. Yeah. And I think probably a lot of those albums, you know, we the technology didn't allow at the time to do more. Um, but now you, you realise that, oh, it would have been nice to have had this in Dolby Atmos or this 5.1 or um, maybe there could have been a different mix of this track or this, this you know, we never got to play that song in the end and um, and also a chance to talk about it, the band, to make a little documentary, to have some live footage. Okay. Um, so it becomes a, a kind of collector's item that, yeah, I mean, I, it amazes me that they can keep doing it, but th they sell really well. Because yeah, In Absentia came out a few years ago, didn't they, in the same sort of format? It did. And actually putting this next to that in my rack, it, it looks really nice. They're mm. exactly the same size, same kind of format. and. Um, it's it's a really nice reissue, uh, all encompassing, really. Excellent. I mean, as I said, I will definitely put a purchasing link ju uh, just below this video. But this album did it not arise from the ashes of a uh, a film project or a film script that 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 didn't get made? I just wonder if there's ever they'll ever revisit that possibly. Yeah, I think Stephen's keen to 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 let to get that to see the light of day because he was hoping that that would have been picked up. It's a screenplay. That's right. Um, and, I, and I read the screenplay and um, and most of the album is is based heavily on that. Mm -hmm. And he was almost ha hoping the two things would go hand in hand, you know. Um, and I don't think there was the interest that, that he and Michael Bennion, who who wrote wrote it with him, um, there wasn't the interest they'd hoped for. Um, but, you know, sometimes with, with a work that you feel close to, you never let it go and you're always looking for a home for it. Yeah. So nice. um I you know, I wouldn't be surprised if that sees the light of day. Right. Okay. Um interestingly though, your label uh, dropped you after this album. Uh is that right? I guess they kind of yeah. It's just that thing where I don't think we lived up to what they thought we could do commercially. Right. They didn't live up to what we thought they might do. Um on a uh on a promotional scale right so was it a mutual thing then really or yeah yeah it was yeah i mean we were kind of friends with the you know the people who were high up in in, in the label uh, uh lava atlantic yeah. and um i think they they were happy for us to to move on in any way which we thought would be best for the band yeah uh, but we we always felt that we were kind of uh we should have had success earlier. You know, we we thought In Absentia was going to be a, a big album. Right. And it actually was. It's proved to be one over the years, but oh, um, it wasn't at the time. Well, it's one of those albums that uh, retrospectively people now really appreciate in the same way Pet Sounds uh, didn't do particularly well when it came out, but now it's, it's okay. right up there. I mean, uh, it does sell very well every year. It sells roughly the same amount without yeah. fail. Well, the artwork is certainly very arresting. I think people, mm. when you see that, you can't uh, can't forget it really. But uh, um, I don't, actually, I just have I think I just have a two CD version of it, or I I'm, I, I should have uh, shelled out for the nice deluxe version. Now, now you've sold it to me. It looks very nice anyway. Um, just read, uh, just been reading um, a Stephen Wilson's biography. Interesting, he says that uh, you, um, if I may quote, he said you didn't relate much to metal. So how did you find the 
the shift, the heavier sound uh, on In Absentia. Uh, did that uh, appeal to you? Well, it was a challenge, right. um, which isn't a bad thing. Yeah. Um, so it, it became a case of rather than what I do becoming a part of the, 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 the starting point of tracks, it was almost like I had to find my way within something that was already there. So there would be these quite uh, kind of heavy block guitars and quite dynamic tracks. And the challenge was to to position what I was doing amongst that, which I enjoyed, you know. Um, it, and sometimes you just have to leave it. You know, you can't always play all the time. Sometimes you realise that it doesn't need anything there. And sure. space has always been the most important part of music for me anyway. So it was a case of finding that space, finding the frequency and the position yeah. in the stereo spectrum where where these kind of um, things could could pop out and could could be heard and have have an effect um on the other hand you know a lot of people never really mentioned that half of that album and dead wing is quite moody and ambient yeah yeah absolutely i mean it's um uh was it in absentia influenced by uh opeth at all that sort of music i think so yeah for stephen yeah he was very much into that at the time uh yeah. opeth and uh probably Meshuggah and these kind of uh, progressive metal bands that were doing quite interesting things, taking taking their music beyond that that genre, yeah. um, and you know nowadays you can't get him near a guitar; he's not interested in them. <laughs> uh, do you think that that do you think that drove the, the the kind of heavy heaviness of in absentia really due to those influences, perhaps? Yeah, yeah, it's because it's how you write the songs, isn't it? It's how you how you start off the track and 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 what becomes the the body of the track and it usually has a personality so the personality of a lot of those pieces were were quite kind of a metal um and listening back now i can hear the influence of uh, of bands like opeth um Meshuggah, even rush in places yeah I mean, interesting. You use the word space, um, uh, ambient textures, and things like that. I mean, how big influence is Brian Eno on you? Massive, right? Absolutely massive. That was kind of the the. That's probably how I got into music, and and what what it enabled me to see a way forward. Put it that way. Um, I was in a band and I was trying to play conventional keyboards and it just wasn't working. I didn't have the technical ability um, to play keyboards in the conventional sense. I had no musical theory. Mm -hmm. um, so I found it very difficult until um, I used a synthesizer. And at the time I was listening to the early Roxy albums and the early Eno solo albums. And, yeah. and it, it just... It, it was like a light at the end of a tunnel. It just showed me a way where you could use abstract sound yeah. uh, within the context of pop or rock music. Right. And that opened the door for me. So then I stopped worrying about what notes to play and I thought more about the sounds and, and how I could uh, bring something different to the track. And the moment that happened, then I became a musical personality and, and I became of use to the band that I was in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and my confidence grew and programming and working with sounds became a massive part of, of, of what I did. And that, so yeah, huge influence. Are you a big fan of um, the David Bowie album, Low, and that sort of Berlin trilogy? I am, I am. Yeah, Low is one of my favourite, well, it's my favourite Bowie album. Uh -huh. It's hard to pick a favourite Bowie album, of course, but um, again, hearing that for the first time was was enlightening. You know, it was just something, it was a breath of fresh air. It's just this uh, amazing sound. Well, it's a strange record. It's got these um, uh, almost quite commercial sounding numbers on the first side, and then yeah. there's all this soundscaping yeah. on the second side. It's a rather quite schizophrenic album in some respects. It is, it is. And the first side is, is quite up, isn't it? And quite kind of, I say jolly, but it's quite sort of a positive kind of sound. Yeah. Uh, quite bright. But... The, the Eno sounds that you can hear going on in the background was that was uh, an incredible part of it for me. Yeah, I think I I just picked out the subtleties. It's it's kind of always been about subtleties for me. Sure. And, um, 
yeah so yeah he he was a, a very big influence do you think uh, um do you think some might think it's a bit odd or contradictory for someone who um identifies as a kind of a, a non-musician i mm. think in an interview you said you were a non-musician mm. to be um uh, in a progressive rock band which is usually associated with all that noodly of course, of course. stuff yeah but i think that's what makes porcupine tree unique i, I yeah, think i agree if i was if i was this technical wizard <clears throat> the keys then it, it would turn into a nightmare very quickly i i think yeah um, and I, I know that the guys in the band feel that as well. And I think we've got this interesting balance of on, on the one hand, Gavin, with this mm. incredible musicianship and, and technical ability. Me on the other side, who's working on more atmospheres and sounds and abstract uh, voices. And, and Stephen is this kind of songwriter who could craft the whole thing together. Yeah. And the <clears throat> great thing is that Stephen has a relationship with each of us. That, that I wouldn't have with Gavin. There's a kind of divide between yeah. myself and Gavin, but Stephen has that connection with both of us. So he loves the kind of music Gavin does as well as he loves the kind of things that I do. Yeah, yeah. I think Stephen Wilson has described Porcupine Tree as a kind of a benign dictatorship. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, um... well, it, it's changed a lot with this last album that we've just yeah. made. Stephen's become this very, um, what's the word? Well, it's the opposite, really, of a dictator. He's he's just really been calm about the whole thing and, and just happy to just uh, write everything together, uh, devolve, uh, you know, decisions to myself and Gavin. Um, he's just very kind of cool and calm. And I think that's because he's had 10 years of a solo career that he now has a definite dividing line. Yeah, yeah. And he Do doesn't have to be that person trying to get everything his own way he doesn't need to do that yeah. um, he can do that with the solo career when he comes to work with me and Gavin now it's it's just uh it's just a pleasurable thing and we can all just contribute equally do you think friction drives creativity or is destructive hmm. well it can do can't it? it does in most cases yeah it does um but I think I think having kind of uh, this opposite thing, like we were talking about between myself and Gavin as well, I think that's that's an interesting uh, part. Mm -hmm. For example, if Gavin writes a song, it might be in three kind of time signatures. And were I to be this amazing musician, I would be playing off of those signatures, doing all this, and it would lead to this type of music that would lead us down the prog tunnel. Yeah. Whereas I approach it in a completely different way. Yeah. I don't even think about the time signatures. I just say, well, this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. yeah. And um, often it, it kind of works well against what Gavin's doing. Which lends Porcupine Tree that wonderful sound that you have. That's that's the thing. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I, interesting. You talk about that prog tunnel. I mean, are you uh, uh, are you fans at all of uh, people like Rick Wakeman or Tony Banks, what they were doing uh, at all in the 70s? I was a massive prog fan in the 70s. Yeah. Um, I, I suppose I had schizophrenic <laughs> love of um, glam rock yeah. and progressive rock. The two don't really go together at all, but I, I love yeah. both of them. And I was very lucky that all this amazing 70s music was, was there for me as a teenager. Yeah. And experiencing yeah. that as a teenager is just, just incredible, you know. Mm -hmm. So I was a massive uh, Genesis fan. Yeah, I love Tony Banks. I still do. Yeah. Very, very kind of has his own thing going. Very musical. I, I, I tended towards the more kind of uh, beautiful side of prog. So I, I, I like Genesis. I like Yes, and I liked Pink Floyd. Right. I couldn't get King Crimson. I couldn't get Van de Graaff Generator. Yeah. It was a harsh sort of sound. I did, you know, it was it sounded a bit ugly to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. ELP, it was all a bit, um, so. That's... Yeah. I mean, it's um, uh, interesting. You've done the album uh, Closure Continuation. I suppose I've got mm. to ask you, which one is it? Well, we have no idea, really. Uh -huh. um, as probably this year, Stephen will be uh, on the trail with a solo album. Okay. So I imagine there'll be lots of, he tends to kind of really downplay Porcupine Tree. 
right. quite badly when he has a solo album out. I don't know why he does it, because there's no need to, but he just does it. Right. <laughs> so I'm sure you'll hear a lot from Stephen with the, no, that's it, it's over. Uh, this is my solo thing now. Right. But who knows? That's what he was, you know, he was saying that in the press only like two or three years ago. Right, right. While we were making the, the new album. Is he kind of sending that tendency up in himself with that title? Do you think Closer Continuation? I think it's a good it's a good title because um, we're quite happy either way, to be honest. Yeah. Um, for me personally, if, if it ended with this album, then I'd be happy because I think we've made a, a great album. I don't think the incident was a great album. Mm -hmm. um, and also, we, we've done a tour and we've ended up with a really good friendship and feeling very relaxed with each other and it's been fun. And it wasn't at the end of, you know, the last tour that we did back in 2010. We'd been working too much. We'd been on the road too long and, you know, it just got to us all, really. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'd be happy with closure, but, um, you know, Stephen's also said he really thinks there could be another album if we can find an, a, another way of using that porcupine tree DNA, but making it still sound fresh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's uh, it's more difficult than it sounds to do. To be, but so who knows? Well, interesting. Uh, Stephen Wilson said that fear of a blank planet um, is an artistic pinnacle for porcupine tree. To what extent would you agree with that? Mm. Well, I, th I think probably I'd say it could be the strongest album, in yeah. my opinion. Certainly that, along with Inner Absentia and, and Closure Continuation. I, I, at the moment, I put those three at the, at the top. Right. Um, I don't know how I'll feel, it, feel in years to come, but, yeah, Fear of a Black Planet is very much a complete album. I mean, the, 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 the concept, I think the... We kind of, I think he said we made progressive rock sound cool. <laughs> and I, I think we really did. I think it's a very modern album, you know? Yeah. Um, I think it's kind of of its time. And, and there's a lot of, we weren't afraid to use new technology and, and, and kind of mix things up a lot. And it's, uh, it's incredibly diverse, but, but very deep sounding album. I, I think we, I agree that we reached some kind of uh, peak at that point yeah and and live as well those live shows were amazing right right so do you think uh progressive rock needed the punk revolution hmm. it's hard hard for me to say because at that time i was in the group called japan yeah and we were making our first couple of albums and we were very influenced by uh, american punk yeah yeah what the students I, I, and stuff like that. Things like uh, television. Okay. Um, Patty Smith, Talking yeah. Heads, Iggy Pop, uh, Richard Hell. Everything. It all seemed to have a kind of art connected to it. Yeah. You know, like they were punks, but they were they were also singing about interesting things. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And there were interesting takes on the music. They all had their own kind of character. Even uh, Suicide. I love Suicide. Yeah, right. Um, in England, it was all about how how shit can you be and how you know awful everything is and how crap we are and didn't really get off on that. We were sort of looking looking outwards, wanting something more special. Um, but yes, yeah, certainly with the American scene and the English scene, um, it's hard. It, it's hard to see where progressive music could have gone and it, and it did just disappear, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It did, yeah. I suppose it emerges in, uh, in the guys of sort of neo prog in the, in the eighties and there were bands like Marillion and yeah. uh, and stuff like that. Well, I think probably the, the cardiacs probably covered both bases, didn't they? To yeah. a certain degree. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what's your, what would you say your proudest musical achievement is in both Japan and porcupine tree? The Albert Hall gig, maybe. Yeah, although now we've played Wembley Wembley uh, Arena uh -huh. with with the new album. Yes. Which 
I kind of I'm really really happy that we did manage to get back together and and, and make another album and um these shows have been amazing so I would put this up there with with the um with the Albert Hall show yeah certainly um and and probably the Fear of a Blank Planet album and this album I think yeah. they're definitely big peaks for Porcupine Tree and and for Japan um Probably Tin Drum was was yeah. the big achievement. Uh, it w- wasn't as enjoyable a, an album for me as as some of the previous ones, but um, I think in terms of the work and the originality, I think we really we really reached a point there um, where we made an album that was pretty timeless. Yeah, even though we were wrapped up in that kind of new romantic thing and we had a certain image. Um, I still think it's now that sounds modern today. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so that that was a that was a big peak, I think. Yeah. And getting a track like Ghosts to to number five in the charts. Yeah, I remember that. Remember it well. Um, I was uh, the early eighties. We still listened mm. to the uh, top forty countdown. I think it was on a Sunday night on the. Mm. You have to have your tape recorder by the radio to to tape yeah. the songs off it. I remember. Um. What was it like working with Giorgio Moroder? Have I said his name correctly? Giorgio Moroder. Yeah. Was, he, was he in any way the reason for the change in Japan's sound at all? What, how much influence did he have over the band? Well, I think the sound the, the sound was there anyway. Uh, the sounds were changing and uh, a lot of people were using sequences. Yeah. That was the basis for the, the Moroder sound from uh, Donna Summer and, and the like. Um, the idea that uh, to work with Maroda was that the record label wanted us to have a hit. Yeah. So I think it was, look, you need to have a hit record. Go to this guy. He's the one, he's the one who'll get you a hit record. And I think we were, we were his only non hit record possibly. Right. Okay. Kind of didn't work, but became a, a cult sort of um, classic. It was played in all the clubs and, yeah. and working with him. I don't know. It was pretty um, sterile. I'd say pretty sterile. I mean, he had, he basically sat there, and another guy did all the work. Right. Um, but he had the you know he had the vision and he had the ideas. Um, yeah. But it was just that kind of sequencer driven thing with a four to the floor, and and then crafting a song on on the top. Uh, we, I think we took that further with the Quiet Life album. We used sequencers, but we were you know incorporating orchestras and. All kinds of sonic yeah. sort of elements into it, and I think we we, we really made a, a mature album with, with quite life. Um, do you think there'd be another Steve Hogarth collaboration? That's really funny you should say that. I was just listening to three tracks that we wrote, that nothing happened after them. We we we're all too busy with our own things. I mean, Marillion are so busy, and then when they do have a break, I guess they really want a break. So. There's been no real time to do anything uh, further, but I, I, I revisited these three tracks that, that we wrote uh, some years ago, and I really like them now, actually. Um, they've got something about them. So I'm thinking, I haven't spoken to Steve yet about it, but I thought maybe just put them, make them available on Bandcamp. Okay. And then possibly do something with a few more tracks and then make a vinyl at some point. An EP, sure. maybe. Um, the thought of, of trying to make an album at this point now, um, it seems quite daunting, to be honest. Uh, I mean, they're, they're just so busy, you know. Really not, yeah. They're always... It's full time, yeah. I mean, with me, I can leave music. You know, I can leave music for a year or two and or just leave one project. Or, um, But I think their thing is very, it's, they're very much on a, on on a treadmill. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not the wrong word. Uh, how was the how was the Rain Tree Crow I- I experience? Um, and uh, of course, we we um, I know we lost uh, Mick Khan, but I just wondered, do you mm. think there'd be any kind of um, uh, Japan thing in the future, maybe? Or I can't imagine that, to be honest. <laughs> right. I can't imagine that. Um, no, I'm 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 very good friends with Steve Jansen. We we kind of see each other, socialize all the time. Um, and we we probably will make some more music. 
I mean, I haven't seen David in decades. I've no idea where he is or, uh, or what really he's doing. Um, and I don't think Steve is in contact with him much anymore either. Mm. So no, I can't see that on the horizon. But um, in terms of the range for Crumb, yeah, it was it started off really well, and we we really enjoyed making the mu the, the album. Yeah. And then towards the end, it just things kind of slipped back into into the way they were, and um, it just became something we you know wasn't very pleasant. Glad to leave behind. Yeah, on a personal level, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, not music musically. We're all very we're pretty proud of that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, there's a silly question for you. If you had to leave planet Earth and you could only take three albums with you, only three, which ones would they be? Mm. I know you discussed David Bowie's Low. Yes, although that doesn't make my top five. Okay. Um, well, I, it'll be for, definitely it'd be Rock Bottom by Robert Wyatt. Oh, yeah. And it would definitely be Spirit of Eden by Talk Talk. Okay. And then it's difficult to choose. It could possibly be Roxy, Roxy Music for your pleasure. Mm -hmm. But it could be Joni Mitchell, Hegira. Okay. Or it could be Dark Side of the Moon, of course. <laughs> the third one is very difficult to choose, so I'd have to just toss a coin on that. But I'd, the first two definitely would be the ones I'd take. Uh, interesting choice for a Joni Mitchell album. I mean, uh, 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 I guess um, uh, people... What's continue... generally the most popular? Well, I mean, I always uh, I keep lauding... I, I love all that sunny folk stuff she did in the 60s, and uh, it's not really... You're, you're supposed to gravitate more towards the more experimental jazz fusion stuff she was doing, but uh, I'm a big fan of the album Ladies of the Canyon. And okay. Things like, and things like that. And Dark Side of the Moon, of course, is, is I think probably my favorite album of all time to be honest with you yeah it sort of sounds boring to say it now doesn't it but you have it to does, yeah. you have to put it in context and you, you you've got to imagine you're listening to this thing for the first time and mm. yeah i mean he's that well i'd have to have that as a third one probably I, I think i think for your pleasure denied. sounds I, I think for your pleasure sounds so much better than the first roxy uh, yeah album. yeah, yeah. It, it does it does um but these are albums I just I end up buying again and again. If there's a reissue or a different pressing or a, di yeah, you know, I go, I like to go to a record store rather than just order online. Um, and I can't believe that I can walk into a record store and buy Dark Side of the Moon and pay what twenty pounds, twenty five pounds. Yeah, yeah. For me, that's amazing that I can buy this amazing work of art for just twenty five pounds. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can you imagine? what a kid would think about that now. Well, it's interesting. Uh, How can you pay all that money? I can just download this. <laughs> <laughs> well, young people don't seem to have, um, I think older, the older generation have a more tactile relationship with, with music and they, they like the vinyl and, uh, and things like that. Uh, interesting, you talked about Dark Side of the Moon. I, I saw a documentary about the making of that album. Mm. David Gilmore says, uh, he never ever got he always wondered what it would have been like to hear that album for the first time because he never had the pleasure of, of doing that which is quite quite interesting really yes you, yes and I, I, I never actually have the pleasure of hearing any album i made in uh in 5.1 uh -huh. i never get the pleasure of hearing it on a really good system yeah i don't i kind of i put everything into the record and while you're making it you 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 make it of the highest quality possible and you, you, you're you so careful about everything and you put so much love and time into it. But once it's done, I'll, I just listen to it on, as an MP3 on an iPod or something. Sure. I'm still using iPods. Yeah. So, I, I don't have a 5.1 system, really. Uh, um, I, I should invest in one, but uh, it's, it's the space, really, to put all this stuff mm. in. But, uh, I have um, one last question for you, really. It's, it's probably another silly one, and that is, uh, which album is the most important, do you think, uh, Pet Sounds or Sgt. Pepper? Culturally, in, in terms of the history of rock music? or Well, I mean, Sgt. Pepper's a better album, I think. Mm -hmm. 
now what's on pet is is god only knows on pet sounds yes, yeah. well i mean that's the, that's my favorite song of all time yeah 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 probably absolutely. that and good vibrations would be my number one and two i mean yeah. they're just unbelievable tracks yeah and a lot of beach boys music for me is more interesting than the beatles yeah okay yeah that's uh um, but exciting. in terms of an album the beach boys could also have the cheesiest quite horrible <laughs> tracks on an album yeah and I, I never quite that's the problem when you're picking your your favorite albums you know for me it, it there can't be any weak moments so um, when you're asking me what's my favorite album i can say dark side of the moon because there there, there isn't a weak no weak moments but then when you're but then you think of bowie and you know like people say well station to station is an amazing album yeah well the track station to station is amazing and it's one of the best intro tracks of all time and there's some brilliant tracks on it but it's also got tvc15 yeah which sounds like the theme to minder yeah <laughs> you know it's just yeah. sort of suddenly the whole mood's gone and i can't i can't put that in my favorite albums well some people argue um oh, so it gone and there were the beatles were like that as well weren't they you know yeah. it would be these cheesy tracks and but evolution of, nine of late that of late um i kind of i'm wondering the beatles may depress me a bit i have to say in what I way find, uh, in that that you know with the documentary everybody was going crazy about yeah yeah the get back one yeah and oh the genius how amazing and every time i see a clip it's just they're playing to some standard rock and roll you know it's just this i know they've made genius tracks and i know there are some amazing sort of uh arrangements but a lot of the time it is really just basic rock and roll and they're just laughing and choosing silly lyrics it doesn't seem like and there's a bitterness there there's a nastiness there it's kind of like yeah. mccartney is trying to own the situation yeah um George Harrison doesn't want to know really he doesn't really doesn't want to be there and he's not obviously not getting his ideas through Lennon was battling a serious heroin addiction I think at that time as well yeah Ringo seems the only one who is trying to make everything happen I mean does it, does it suggest to you that maybe McCartney was more the driving creative force in the Beatles uh than uh if you consider that dip you were mentioning in terms of John Lennon mm. yeah absolutely yeah yeah I would I would say so. that that's what I got that's what I got from it um, yeah. yeah I I I just love it when 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 bands or artists just kind of evolve but not necessarily in a, a commercially acceptable way just in a in a in a more artistic way and they just experiment yeah you know uh talk talk did that um Bowie did that Scott Walker did. Roxy Music went the other way. Roxy Music just became more and more middle of the road. They did, yeah. And that's did. what Ferry always wanted, I guess. Uh, no, I'm for me. His peak was was Amazon was um, Avalon. Uh, for me, the uh, Roxy Music. I mean, I love those later Roxy albums as well. But I mean, for me, the pinnacle of Roxy stuff is those first two records that they did with Brian Eno. Um, but interesting, we mentioned Strawberry Fields. Uh, have you ever noodled or played around with a Mellotron? Yes, yes. Whenever there's one around, we've always used it. Um, you know, now there's so many different emulations. Yeah. Um, oh, temperamental, aren't they? Yes, yes. I used them uh, with Japan. No. And it was, uh, we were always in the Beatles studio as well, a lot of the time, or McCartney's sort of studio. So um, they had all the, a lot of the Beatles tapes were on there as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it's great. It's great to use, but yeah, it just, I don't know it just feels like you're playing a load of bits of wood <laughs> just <laughs> very odd but but brilliant tactile and uh, amazing are they big style. heavy things as well they've got yeah, yeah yeah so imagine yeah. lumping one of them about if you're on tour it must have been a yeah they did yeah, yeah i mean that and a and a hammond organ because <laughs> that was a progressive rock setup wasn't it It was a mellotron a hammond organ and like a mini move or something yeah absolutely yeah <laughs> anyway um uh, I'd like to thank you uh, so much for agreeing to do this uh, this interview. Um, I hope you can, I'll let you dash off and get a cup of tea or something now. Um, as I said, I'll put the link uh, to the um, the Deadwing Deluxe Edition just under this video. Okay. Uh, 
and uh, I enjoy the rest of your night. Thank Thanks, you I enjoyed it. It was great. Yeah, I was worried we were going to focus too much on this because there's a lot I don't remember. Well, I was told in the interview that we we had to focus on that, but I, I just um, I just think two or three questions is enough, really. To be honest with you, there's there's yeah. other things to talk about, but uh, no, I really inter it was really interesting. Thank you so much.